Our first scripture this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, Just as you did it to one of these, the least of my brothers, you have done it to me. Then he will say to the others at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly, I say to you, just as you did not do it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did not do it for me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Our second reading is from the book of Acts, and it is the basis of our sermon, uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who believed in the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The man who... The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could not see anything. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias... And he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision. A man named Ananias would come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house, He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, 
has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Let's pray. God, our Father, we're talking about change, conversion today. We pray that you would be at work in our hearts and minds to allow us to see the kinds of changes that need to occur in our lives. Help us to be converted, we pray, from our own way of thinking, our own way of doing things, to your way. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. There's a silly story about a man who went to his doctor complaining about terrible neck pains, throbbing headaches, and recurring dizzy spells. The doctor examined him and said, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, if this is what I think it might be. You may very well have a brain tumor, and if that's the case, you probably only have about six months or so to live. Before more tests could be done, the doomed man decided he would spend his remaining time on earth enjoying life. He quit his job, bought a sports car and a closet full of new clothes and shoes. Then he went to get himself a dozen tailored shirts. He went to the finest shirt shop he could find. The tailor measured him and wrote down size 16 neck. Wait a minute, the man interrupted. I've always worn a size 14 neck and that's what I want. The tailor said to him, I'll be glad to do it for you, sir. However, if you wear a size 14 neck, I can guarantee you that with your size 16 neck as it actually is, you're going to have terrible neck pains, throbbing headaches, and recurring dizzy spells. The tailor had unknowingly unmasked the man's real problem. Real problems require real solutions. But too often we do not recognize the real cause of our problems and try to make easy fixes that accomplish little because they never identify the real problem. Consider humankind's basic problem. There's something wrong with humanity, something sick, something twisted, something perverted. The Bible calls it sin. But where is the solution? The solution is called conversion. This morning, we need to deal with the nature of conversion. Many of us are like the middle school student who had just begun confirmation. The pastor was quizzing the class on the meaning of certain religious words like baptize or repentance, etc., to see what they already knew. One boy was asked, what is conversion? He thought for a moment and gave the only definition that he knew. He said, it's the extra point that is kicked after a touchdown. I hope that we know more about conversion than that. Conversion is a biblical word which means a change in direction. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word used means to return or turn back. The verb form of that word appears over a thousand times in the Old Testament. So we see that it's an important need in people's lives. In the New Testament, we have two Greek words that convey the same kind of idea of the need to change directions in one's life. Change is what conversion is about. There need be no blinding light or visitation by angels, but there must be a change if we are to be followers of Jesus Christ. Our text from the book of Acts centers on the most famous conversion in history, the conversion of St. Paul. The ninth chapter of Acts begins this way, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of Jesus, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The name of Saul of Tarsus struck fear in the hearts of the members of the early Christian community. As the man God would send to heal, Paul would say to God when he was commanded to go to the house on the street called Straight, he gave the impression and objection to God that Saul was a fanatic 
in his hatred for those who serve Christ. He was fearful. But this man of violence was struck down by a vision, a vision of Christ as king, who said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That's an important question. Why was Saul persecuting Christ? Why was Saul persecuting the early Christians? What had they ever done to him? Why persecute people who simply look at life in a different way than you do? If we think that's an idle question, just look at the death and destruction throughout our world in recent history waged in the name of religion. And you can go back over many years as well. Protestant and Roman Catholic, not all that long ago in Northern Ireland, were fighting. Jews and Muslims in the Middle East, Hindus and Muslims in Kashmir, as well as hundreds of other major or minor conflicts throughout the world. Indeed, as secular states and movements begin finally to accommodate one another, one wonders if the last remaining threat to world peace may be misguided religious zeal. There's something within the holiest and most loving impulse of all, the response of a human heart to God, that can be corrupted by sin, which turns it into an excuse for anger, hatred, even violence. It's important that we see that Saul, the persecutor, became Paul, the preacher of love. Here's the first sign of authentic conversion of a soul to Jesus Christ. We are converted from a life of hate to a life of love. How can that be? The very nature of God is love. How can a man or a woman stand before God or humanity and spew out hatred in the name of Jesus Christ? It's a contradiction in terms. Jesus spells it out even more succinctly. Notice what he says. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? This is one of the most terrifying questions in all of the New Testament. It brings with it the realization that when we commit violence or any act of hatred towards another, we're persecuting Christ. When you've done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me, said Jesus in our text from Matthew 25. He was not speaking simply of acts of kindness, but evil acts as well, as the second half of our reading points out. It's clear in the conversion of St. Paul that conversion means moving from a life of hate to a life of love. We simply cannot overstate this truth. How often in the past has religious feeling turned into raw bigotry? There's a time-honored story about a church basketball league game between a Baptist and a Methodist church. Competition was stiff and heated. One spectator, however, cheered for both teams. When the Methodist made a good drive toward the basket, the man cheered. He did the same when the Baptist executed well. At this point, a Methodist nearby stood to his feet, grabbed the man and jabbed the man in the back and shouted, Good Lord, man, ain't you got any religion at all? To which the man said, Sure, I'm a Lutheran, but I just appreciate good basketball, no matter who's playing. We can laugh at such a rivalry now, but there was a time on the American frontier when a popular song expressed more intense feelings. It went something like this. And if you will not join us, we bid you now farewell, for we are bound for heaven and you are bound for hell. We can laugh at that, but there was a time not very long ago when blood was shed because of differences in biblical interpretation. Even more importantly, the same poisonous religious pride showed itself in its demonic horror in Nazi Germany and the persecution of the Jews under Adolf Hitler. We dare not forget that. There's a beautiful story that comes from that tragic era. During the first wave of the persecutions under Hitler, many Jews sought to pass themselves off as Christians. They even joined churches. The Nazis were wise to that kind of action. They required one Roman Catholic priest to read a message before the Mass. It said, bow your heads, please, and close your eyes. Will all those with Jewish fathers please leave this building? There's a slight rustle as people obeyed. 
Now will all those with Jewish mothers please leave? There was more noise and a slight pause. Then the priest instructed the congregation to open its eyes. The crucifix above the altar of the church was now empty, having been removed by the priest in protest. Jesus, a son of a Jewish mother, had left with the others, at least symbolically. It was the priest's way of protesting. We cannot tolerate any kind of bigotry within the body of Christ, religious or otherwise. We need to be reminded that a young Mahatma Gandhi visited a Christian church in South Africa as a student. He was intensely drawn to the person of Jesus Christ and the teachings of the gospel. He had read the Bible very carefully. But an usher refused to seat him, suggesting that he go worship with his quote-unquote own people. What a difference might have been made if this man, who was revered by millions throughout the world, had been accepted that day in the spirit of Christ. The first sign of an authentic conversion is that of a life changed from hate to love. In the second place, we need to see that this change from hate to love is made possible because we are converted from a life of fear to a life of faith. Jesus asked, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul answered, who are you, Lord? Jesus answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul met Christ, and what he experienced was a conversion of his whole heart. He was converted to an entirely new personality. The man who consented to the stoning of Stephen became the man who could write in 1 Corinthians 13, Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrong, but rejoices in right. How does a man change that radically? That happens when he moves from a life dominated by fear to a life dominated by faith. Why do we allow ourselves to hate others? Any psychologist will tell us we do it out of fear. Here's a practical truth we all need to know. The angry person is a fearful, fearful person. It's, not, it's out of insecurity that we strike out. Fear of our own worth, our own adequacy, our own acceptance. Here's the key to all the unrighteous anger, all bigotry, hatred, and all unprovoked violence. Why could Jesus accept and love all people? There was not an insecure bone in his body. He knew who he was. Thus he feared no one. We hate those whom we fear. There's no better example of that truth than Adolf Hitler himself. His family life was almost guaranteed to breed a tyrant. As a small child, he was bullied, beaten, and denounced but as a weakling and worthless idol, idler by his drunken father. Adolf Hitler spent his entire adult life bullying others, seeking to prove his own worth. Millions of lives throughout the entire world were destroyed because of Hitler's fears that his father might be right. St. Paul met Christ and his own fears were removed. He not only discovered who Christ was, but he also discovered who he was as well. Maybe that is why he could no longer be called Saul. He really was a new man, heart, soul, and spirit. He had a new confidence and a new courage that dispelled all hatred from his heart. Such confidence and courage are rare. Years ago, it was well exemplified by a black minister in whose front yard a band of Ku Klux Klan ruffians had set a burning cross. This could have been a terrifying experience for the pastor's young children. Such fear could later on have turned to blind, blind racial hatred on the part of the children if not checked. What did this committed pastor do in the face of this act of hatred and cowardice? He walked into his kitchen, found some marshmallows and some roasting forks, and he and his wife and two children and their neighbors roasted marshmallows on the fire that the bigots had ignited. If there is anger in your heart today, or hatred, or bitterness, are you ready for a Damascus Road experience? Are you ready for a heart transplant, a personality transplant? 
Authentic Christian conversion means a real change from hate to love, from fear to faith in Jesus Christ. This is to say that when we meet Christ, we are converted from darkness to light. I'm fascinated by verse 8. It reads, Saul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. On the surface, the sentence refers to physical blindness. There had been a bright flash, and now St. Paul was blind. But so often, Christ used the images of darkness and light, blindness and sight, to make a point. So there may be more here than just the surface truth. Saul's eyes were opened, and yet he could see nothing. Could this imagery be referring to a new beginning for Saul of Tarsus as he would become Paul? Saul had been given a new slate. His past had been erased. Now it was time for the Holy Spirit to write new truths upon his heart. His past may have been soiled, but his future was spotless. A man named Ananias was sent by God to fill in the content. Again, we're talking about a real change. Jesus said to Nicodemus that he must be born all over again, born from on high. It was not on his own power to change. That was the kind of experience Saul was having. His previous indoctrination was inadequate and needed to be totally swept away. After his Damascus Road experience, his eyes were opened. We could see nothing. He needed to immerse himself in the teachings of the apostles. He needed to feed on the fellowship of fellow believers. He needed to study and pray and grow. That's something that many people don't do today. That's why their lives are not changed. The goal was that Paul would soon be see things that he had never seen before. His conversion was not an ending but a beginning. So I ask you this morning, is your collar a little tight this morning? Has St. Paul's experience on the Damascus Road helped you diagnose your real need? If so, are you ready to accept the transformation of your life? Are you ready to receive a new heart, a new love for God and your fellow man, a new confidence about yourself in the light of God's love for you, and an openness to a new agenda for your life? If so, You are ready for our authentic Christian conversion. That which you desire, the Father grants. So do you truly desire it? I hope and pray that you do. Let us pray. God our Father, each of us has areas of our lives that need to be converted. There are things we need to move away from. There's control in our own lives that we have to give up to you so that you can change us and move us in new directions. So we pray that this word about the conversion of St. Paul might spur us to open ourselves up to newness of life found in Jesus Christ. Help us open ourselves and allow you to become Lord and Savior of our lives in a way that changes and transforms our direction and our vision. Amen.